Um, continuing with what we did yesterday, uh, today with lesson three, unit three, lesson three is define points and gather evidence. So by the time you complete this lesson, you will be able to find points of comparison or contrast from text to support your thesis. So now thinking more about uh, filling out the body of our writing response. So, you know, the thesis is gonna be a, a, a very key point of our introduction. Um, and what we'll need to go along here is start to compare and contrast those two writings. Um, so let's listen to the audio. After you have developed your thesis, the next step is to define points of comparison or contrast between the passages and start gathering textual evidence. Begin by rereading the passages. As you read, identify the main arguments or reasons and supporting evidence given by each author. Note how their reasons and evidence are alike or different. Look also for examples of rhetorical techniques the authors use to support their arguments. In your extended response, you can use specific points of comparison and contrast between the passages as topics to include in your own argument. Select at least one example from each passage to support every point you identify. Yeah, so you're going to have multiple points to make, um, at least probably three uh, or so. So, and that's what we're going to kind of work on today. And what we have here. I don't, you know, this, this web is not really necessary. You could just have a list of, of the same ideas, but um, what we, um, the idea here, right, is that any of those circles are uh, possible points for comparison or, or, or contrast, right? So, in some cases, some will be a lot more relevant. They'll be easier to make. Some other ones you might not really get to use. Um, but this is a nice list of how you're going to go about it. So, of course, you know, you're going to look at their points of view and their claims, reasons behind those, the evidence, tone, uh, rhetorical techniques, and responses to counter arguments. And all of that is fair game to, you know, continue to write about in. Um, the um, in the body of your of your response. So hold on a second. I'm gonna. There we go. Okay. So um, the text box A says the circles indicate points of comparison or contrast between the two articles. Start thinking about how each author uses these points. And then take note of elements such as word choice and point of view in each text. They can help you determine an author's attitude toward the subject. And, you know, that way, um, it doesn't just have to be about evidence, right? There's other reasons that a, uh, a passage may be convincing to you. It may be because of the tone. It might be because of the rhetorical techniques they use. And all that would be fair game to say, you know, that's why I you know, chose passage A over passage B. Um, and just as we're going along here, if you want to reference this as we're working through it, or so some of the other um, past, um, you know, ideas, the elements that we've looked at. So argument structure and appeals and faulty reasoning and evidence and rhetorical devices, I've brought up all those old pictures if we want to review them as we go along. Um, because they may help, you know, you decide which way to go. So let's take a look then at the workbook. And, oh, I'm sorry, not the workbook, the quiz. All right. Let me follow up here real quick. So we're dealing with the same passages we've been seeing. So I don't know if it's going to really help anybody to read those again. Um, you know, this is like the, the third time we've seen them. Uh, so it's the, the Clift 
passage on teaching online uh, is what we're going to start with. And then that Jones uh, passage on the benefits of online education, right? And, you know, we worked a lot with that yesterday and before. So I think that's probably she'll, still should be fresh in everybody's and the two points that they made. So we'll kind of move past actually trying to read them. Uh, just consider, you know, that uh, Cleft was uh, against teaching online because of her experience, right? And, uh, you know, she made the point about the anonymity of the students and uh, the quality of the materials and not being able to, um, you know, help with writing. And then also the amount of time and energy that she put into uh, constructing her class. Whereas, um, Jones talked about the flexibility and the self-management that allowed students to um, you know, attend classes when they wanted and they could access notes and things like that. And um, then, you know, uh, in, uh, are, um, uh, taking classes now online. 32% have taken at least one online class. So the GED format, right, allows electronic highlighting. I think I mentioned this. You will be able to, um, you know, take notes, uh, highlight things, which could be a big help for you guys um, as you're writing. You, and of course, you're doing this online too. So if you want to, you know, have a, uh, you know, uh, pen and paper next to you, you can also do that. You know, you're going to have your calculators for math and, and science and stuff like that too. So, um you know, use every tool available. And like I mentioned, you can use those templates that I gave you. Um, you know, you can have all of that available for you and, you know, it's not cheating in any way. Um, so keep that in mind. And any other notes like cheat sheets, um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, you don't know exactly what the questions are, but if it's something um, related to uh, you know, just just reference type materials you can have those nearby. All right, so question one, uh, we're starting off with multiple choice, then we're going to get into more sort of writing practice. So let's start. Um, Grace, you want to answer question one for us? Left article contrasts with that of uh, with that of the Jones article. And the tone of the Cliff article is gloomy, but sarcastic. B. The tone of Cliff's articles article is positive, but the tone of the Jones article is neutral. C. The tone of Cliff article is negative, but the tone of the Jones article is positive. D, the tone of the Cliff article is neutral, but the tone of the Jones article is positive. C. Right, yeah, so <clears throat> that, that was you know pretty straightforward, right? We noticed the way she's talking about it. Uh, of course, um, you know, she's against it, so it tends to have a negative tone. She just has a little bit of a, a bitterness, right, that kind of comes out in her, in her um, tone there. Uh, the, the, even the way she kind of commissions, you know, call me old fashioned and out of date, just don't call me teach online. There's a little bit of, uh, of sarcasm there. So it's a negative tone. And then Jones, of course, you know, uses a more positive because he thinks online education is, is really, you know, going to be part of a future of the future and, you know, ends on that idea of, you know, it's revolutionizing education and providing new and exciting opportunities. So very positive. And again, that's something that you could point out in your writing response, you know, why you chose one over the other, um, that does matter. So it doesn't just have to be about the evidence and how you feel about evidence. You can point out other parts of, uh, or other points. And that's all, that's kind of what we're working with today. Um, so yeah, here we go. What we're gonna start looking at uh, are points of comparison or contrast, right? So. The directions say, look for points of comparison and contrast in the articles. Uh, you know, I'll never teach again online, or I'll never teach online again and the benefits of online education. Use the web in the first item to help you select an element to compare and contrast. So they're talking about, right, this, that's the web. 
um, and all those elements in there, claim, reason, evidence, tone, uh, rhetorical techniques, response to counter arguments. Um, so to help you select an element to compare and contrast, fill in the note boxes below with the requested information, then describe how the text evidence from the two articles is alike or different in the space provided. So just going that step beyond, right? Yesterday we talked about evidence a little bit, more so on the side of the thesis, right? We, we saw how that broke down from the major claim, like their thesis, to supporting claims, and then down to their supporting evidence. Um, here, thinking a little more broadly about other aspects and all of that uh, is relevant. So. Let's work through the first one. I'll, I'll get us started here. I'll go ahead and do the first one so we can kind of see how this is gonna play out. So um, like here, point of comparison or contrast. So typically you're probably gonna wind up contrasting more than you compare, right? Because they're gonna have two, point, two different points of view. One's typically going to support whatever you know, thing, idea it is while the other one is uh, opposed to it. Um, but there may also be from time to time comparisons. Here, what we'll do, I'm gonna put, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll copy and paste this into the chat so you guys can, can do the same. Cliff um, focuses on her personal experience, right? We talked about that, it's, it's anecdotal, it's just her experience. Um, Jones focuses on the experience of the student, which we mentioned yesterday, right? Yeah. Of students. Okay, so there, right? We have uh, a, a, a little bit of contrast, right? Where the focus of the two are different. So I'll paste that into the chat. Okay, you guys can copy and paste that as we go. And then the um, text evidence, right? So if you're gonna make that, if you're gonna point that out, you need to have an evidence, right? To, to basically support it. You know, I can't just make that uh, claim without having some supporting evidence there. So in Cliff's case, um, you know, she mentions like she's not able to um, help, uh, uh, not able to adequately adequately help uh, her students develop um, better writing. Right, so she mentions that. So. Again, copy and paste. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, so clips. So then Jones, right? Um, so he uses a, a student's testimony, right? He uses Rebecca. And generally, right, he just talks about uh, the student's perspective, but we'll use uh, that particular evidence. So Jones's evidence, uh, Rebecca's story about, uh, how, how would you put it, about oh, being able to find notes, right, for her professor. So Rebecca, an online student recalls, when I miss a class, I miss the notes. Now I'm able to access the professor's course notes whenever I need them. So we can just, you know, and again, this is sort of like our own shorthand, just to, just to think about how we're going to, you know, later construct that and put that into the body of our running response. So Rebecca's story about accessing uh, her professor's notes. Right? That's all we need. Copy and paste. So with that as an example, do you see sort of how this is gonna roll, right? How we're going from the point of contrast, right? 
uh, or comparison, if we find some comparisons. Uh, one has using personal experience, one is focusing on the experience of students, right? And then we have to make our claim or we have to show some evidence of that. So that's something you would do in the body of your essay in your writing response. You would, you know, mention it's like, uh, you know, just what we have here then you might follow up with why one is more convincing than the other, right? That would be your next point, but we'll get to that later on. For now, let's just focus on the points. So um, <clears throat> how is the text evidence from the two articles alike or different? What do you guys think? What makes them alike? What might make them different? Um. They are different because um, Cleft is talking from like his own experience. Whereas, um, what's his name? The other uh, one. Jones, yeah. Jones, yeah, Jones is talking from the uh, from student's perspective. There you go. So it goes back, right, to the, to, um, the, you know, the original point we're making here, right? So point of comparison. Um, so we'll just put, you know, uh, we'll start with Cliff. Um, Cliff, Cliff's passage um, uses her own experience um, to support her argument. No, it's true, Sasha Gay, you mentioned in the in the uh, the chat there, right? They are both talking about the same um, the same thing, right? So that's something else you could use. Um, so and I'm gonna mention something else here uh, when we when we finish. So Jones um, on the other hand, right, use a little transitional language there, on the other hand, uses um, experience from students. Okay, so there's the way they're different, right? Different perspective again. They're alike though, because they both use anecdotal evidence, right? We talked about this as well. So Cliff uses her own experience. Um, Jones uses the experience of students. Now, in, I mentioned, you know, it's, okay, that's, that's fine. You can definitely, you know, you know, thread that into a, a an argument. Um, but if you're only relying on that, right, it becomes a problem. An anecdote only speaks to one experience or an individual's experience, or, you know, maybe somebody you know's experience. It doesn't speak for everyone. And that might not be the experience of, you know, the mass, or it might not be the average experience, right? Um, you know, my wife had knee surgery, uh, you know, back in uh, last year, um, not everybody has knee surgery, right? And even when you have like, <laughs> all right, here's an even better example. She's still recovering. Um, she's doing really well. But she still has pain. Um, she had the same surgery as Joe Burrow. Um, Joe Burrow took his team to the Super Bowl about 10 months after, you know, having reconstructive surgery. Uh, and my wife is still, you know, not completely 100%, right? Those are two different experiences and there's a lot of reasons behind them. So, you know, Joe Burrow met my wife is like, wow, why is it taking you so long to recover? You know, it's like, I took, it took me like six months. Um, yeah, well, you know, he's like in his twenties and he's an athlete and, you know, it's expected for him to recover. So, you know, his experience is going to be different than somebody else's. Uh, and same thing with my wife, somebody else may take even longer. So anecdotes, that's something that you really want to point out, right? If, if, if you get to that passage in your writing response, if somebody's using anecdotal evidence, that's something you can really hammer on um, as far as, you know, it's like, well, it, there's not enough statistical evidence here. They don't use uh, expert testimony or anything like that. It's simply their own experience. So I am going to include that. Both use um anecdotal evidence for their 
claims. Well, Jones also uses some statistics, right, as far as how many people, uh, you know, have taken classes. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing, right? Uh, but he does point that out. And he also uses some other, you know, types of evidence. So just putting that in there, right? So Cliff's passage uses uh, her own experience to support her argument. Jones, on the other hand, uses experience from students. Um, and then both use anecdotal evidence for their claim. So that's ways they're similar. And there's ways there's different there. Okay, now we're moving along. Hopefully everybody's able to get those answers. I don't want to move too fast here. For three, we're going to do the same thing again, right? Another point of comparison and contrast. We want to do three here. So um, what would be another point of comparison or contrast? You know, consider yesterday as well, because this is all as far as those reasons go and, and anything else. So we can use anything. Tell you what, I'll pull the uh, picture up here of our, where did my web go? Oh, here it is, okay. So there's our points that we can look at. What would be something else that we could compare and contrast here? Oh, they all talk about traditional classroom, traditional. Okay, oh. so like, um, how, like, um, let me go back to the passage. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Oh. Uh, in um I, how should I put it? <laughs> um, it's about they both talk about the traditional, but Clift prefers the traditional to that of the online. And mm -hmm. uh Jones Jones also prefers the online to that of the classroom, but I don't know how to frame the sentence. Well, how about we look at, um, so let's go to maybe another um, reason, right? So okay. if we go with say the quality of education. Okay, so okay. Um, can I say uh, in, John's paragraph four, he says, lastly, online education offers exciting options for students with different learning styles. So uh, can I say um, the online offers um, different learning styles as compared to the traditional one? Um, yeah, so like, do you mean like the flexibility or for, for like, what's with that? It features multimedia um, elements. Okay. But so, yeah. the classroom does not. I, I think, okay, I think we can put that together. So we'll say uh, for Cliff's side, right? We'll say the, um, the, the quality of materials, right? Uh, yeah. Cliff states the quality of materials is insufficient. Fancy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jones. Um, again, this is where you kind of you know think of word choice and everything. Um, how about Jones finds the um, variety of materials? Yeah. Um. Better for 
a large variety of students. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. So, and that, I think that really, yeah. So, and, and those are good, very uh, um, close comparisons because we're talking about the types of materials, right? On uh, uh, Cliff's side, she thinks they're insufficient, but Jones sees them as uh, having a, a, a more a, a better opportunity for a larger variety because you can you know introduce multimedia and things like that. So when we get to the evidence, we'll be able to discuss that. Oh, 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 let me put that in the chat. Okay. So there's another contrast. And for Cliff, um, um, so she says, you know, she's only able to um, yeah, produce students to limited amounts of material so outside of this book, yeah. Only able to introduce a small quantity of material. You know, again, it doesn't have to be their words. Um, so only able to introduce a small quantity of material of, I need of in there. Okay. Copy, get that paste. Okay. And Jones um, points out um, the opportunity to introduce a wide variety of material. How's that one? Okay. Now, when we get to question down here, <clears throat> so how is that text evidence from the two articles alike or different? Um, I would say um, so they are different because uh, Cliff talks about having small quantity of materials whilst Jones has a wide variety of materials. Have access to, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking the, um, they're alike though, right? Because they're both talking about materials. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, let's, let's start with that, right? Because they can both be, you know, at the same time, they can be similar and different, right? You can compare and contrast same elements. So we'll say um, their evidence is alike. Um, talk about the same material, talking about material. Yeah, because they both discuss materials, but differ on. Um, uh, but Cliff claims an adequate amount of materials, yeah. while Jones um, claims a wide, wider variety. Yeah. And again, you know trying to kind of make sure that we have like complete sentences and everything, but this is more about us fleshing out ideas. So, you know, we're not really hammering on, you know, grammar and spelling and all that stuff. Um, oh, wait, I didn't, okay. I need to do that first and add the, the last one. Okay. So there we go. There's the there's the one for Jones article. I, I didn't uh, I forgot to hit enter. 
in the chat there. So there's that introduced wide variety of material. And then how is the text evidence from the two articles alike or different? So their evidence is alike because they both discuss materials, but Cliff claim, <laughs> so yeah, see I am making grammatical errors, but Cliff claims inadequate amount of materials while Jones claims a wider variety. We'll talk about verb noun agreement in unit four. All right, <clears throat> so there we go. And we'll have one more here. I'm thinking, let's talk about tone, right? Um, that's a fairly easy one. Yeah. And it's mentioned above, right? So we could use that. So um, Cliff's tone is negative while Jones's tone is positive. Okay. Notice my possessive there, apostrophe S. Something else we'll talk about in unit four. Um, <clears throat> so our evidence, look here. Um, oh, let me copy and paste that. Copy, paste. And um, so we could point to as far as her tone goes. Oh, can we use um, that flexibility too? Yeah, yeah. Um, so well, I'll just mention like, um, uh, how should, how, you know, basically, where, where does she say it? Um, so my um, first- June said it's, it's, it's flexible. Yes, yeah. So um, for Cliff, I'm, I'm just gonna put that she, um, you know, says that she's she is, completely, how can I put it? Um, is um, Cliff's tone, or Cliff, uh, Cliff is unwilling to try uh, online teaching again. Right, mm -hmm. he's you know stubborn about that. Yeah, and Jones um, points uh, points out flexibility, and uh, let's see what else we put there. It's, at the end, he really kind of hammers into the the positive elements right providing new and exciting opportunities so we'll say he points out the flexibility and the opportunity presented um, by online learning forward, right okay. okay so And for our text evidence, right? Um, I would say, you know, Clift is, is stubborn. Um, Clift has a tone that, that, that kind of comes off as stubborn. Uh, but Jones um, kind of speaks more to the future, right? Of, of online learning and the possibility. So I'll say, um, or I mean, yeah, yeah, that works. Uh, is stubborn and refuses uh, to teach online again. Jones, uh, displays 
optimism by looking towards the future, yeah, the future, the future. Okay. How does that work for you guys? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, all right. That is the quiz part, right? And I think when we go over to the workbook, we'll look at the other two articles. Um, so we might do a quick refresher and run through them real quick. And it's just uh, really expounding out what we, what we did here. Um, so everything's in the chat there. Um, so I'll go ahead and close this one out. And, you know, the thing about the sort of template ideas, um, it, I know it'll work well for some of you guys more so than others. Um, for me, I, my mind doesn't really work in a really, I, you know, tend to work a little bit of an in abstract. I don't make a lot of outlines when I write. I don't, um, <clears throat> you know, um, I just kind of do it. <laughs> You know, which I don't know, might be bad for me. But um, so, you know, hopefully, um, you know, don't don't get concerned if this doesn't really work well for you, because there's going to be other things and other kind of skills that might work out better. Uh, and you might be the person, the, the type of person that just starts writing. And that's OK, too. Um, but here we'll at least get a little bit of um, exercise to, you know, think about the different points and stuff. So, you know, don't don't think that, you know, you have to use this to write. Um, it's just kind of helping you getting, you know, getting the juices flowing to do that. Um, and uh, so it says before you write your extended response, you must determine what points you will use to support your thesis. So, you know, that even you can mentally map that out, but you might want to jot down some notes as well. Uh, begin by rereading the passages and identifying points of similarity between them. Uh, for each point you define, identify supporting evidence from each passage. Your extended response should include at least three points of comparison and at least one example from each passage per point. So, you know, keep in mind, that's what you want to do is set on about three examples that you're going to pull, you know, points of, com of comparing or contrasting. Um, that should be, you know, about three paragraphs, right? So you're going to have an introductory paragraph, uh, about three paragraphs worth of, of comparison and analysis, right? And then, and then a conclusion. So about four or five paragraphs total. So for example, one point of similarity uh, between the passages by Clement and Leung, so we're moving to the other passages now, uh, is that they both address counter arguments. You may explain how each author acknowledges and responds to a specific counter argument, then evaluate which author responds to counter arguments more effectively. So we can do that in uh, our exercise here. We'll, we'll make that one of them. So we could also use a Venn diagram, which we talked about, right? Uh, so, you know, you compare and contrast, um, and then in the space, you know, that overlaps, you put what is similar. Uh, so that's another, uh, you know, uh, exercise or another sort of um, tool that you could use. Okay, and that's sort of what we're going to have here. Um, it'll be uh, sort of this idea, which is a little clunky. Um, I kind of prefer the Venn diagram, um, but we're going to be sort of working in the sort of the same format as we just did with the text. So um, don't let that confuse you. I want to go ahead and reread these uh, so we can have a refresher. I think some, some of y'all weren't here yesterday. So um, this will help us get, get uh, thinking about these two passages. So you'll remember we had um, this uh, lady, Marsha Clement, social media explosion was the article and talking about it becoming a distraction. And remember, 2013. Um, so, you know, things have changed in that time. Uh, so the appeal of socializing online has created a nation of mobile device fans, many of whom can go barely 10 minutes without checking their smartphones. Some believe that social media may already be changing how people think and learn, right? There's the thesis, uh, our main point. 
When electronic devices were becoming popular, some hoped that they would teach a new generation how to multitask better than previous generations did. Counterclaim. But research shows that people who grew up with electronic devices really can't multitask either, says Larry Rosen, a professor of psychology at California State University, uh, Dominguez Hills. As a result, the typical technology-obsessed person now gives continuous partial attention to just about everything and full attention to almost nothing. You never do anything in depth, right? There's our evidence, right, from our professor of psychology. You're constantly interrupted and you're self-interrupting too, he says. The very nature of the brain seems to decree that for many activities, people simply can't do two or more tasks at once. In addition, while the brain can switch rapidly from task to task, doing so takes more time to do the task. In addition, he says, you simply don't do as thorough a job and some tasks simply aren't amenable to being done in a shallow way. The repeated switching of attention also adds to one's stress, okay? And then our final piece of evidence, right? And our, our reason and then our evidence. So the reason the sleep disruptions that go along with social technology may help account for mental changes, says Kaveri Subramanian, a professor of psychology at California State University, Los Angeles, the digital native generation, teens and young 20-somethings who have grown up with these technologies, sleep with a cell phone and get up in the middle of the night to respond to text. She says, um, while the long-term effects of such behavior are unknown, research has shown that frequent sleep interruptions make it harder for the brain to consolidate the day's learning and memories, she says. So there's our second evidence from our expert. And before you're done, you're gonna be able to recite these uh, in your sleep uh, if we keep working with these. And then our second one, right? She had a supporting the idea of uh, social networks and, and sort of online. Uh, so you call your son, daughter, or spouse to dinner. Just a minute, he or she yells in the distance. You hear the clicking of fingers on a keypad. A familiar annoyance builds. You respond, stop texting and get in here. The next time you find yourself in this situation, you may decide to hold your tongue. Some studies have shown that texting improves communication skills, right? There's her thesis. Some studies show Texting improves communication. <clears throat> Researchers at Coventry University have found that texting is about more than wasting precious time and annoying family members. In reality, texters may be improving their literacy skills. Dr. Beverly Plester says, the more exposure you have to the written word, the more literate you become, and we tend to get better at things we do for fun. Recent criticism that text language including abbreviations and contractions, for example, may begin to appear in formal writing, have not proven true. Dr. Plester continue, concludes that text language follows the general rules of language and that people have a sophisticated understanding of the appropriate use of words. So we get a reason, right, as far as uh, uh, improved literacy, that all in that one paragraph. Improved literacy is her, is her claim. Uh, she uses Dr. Beverly Plester for evidence. Then she goes to a counterclaim, right? She goes to that um, retort, that recent criticisms, that text language, you know, da, 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 da. And then she deals with that with the same, um, you know, professor or doctor uh, with a statement there. So refuting the counterclaim. Furthermore, transitional language, adding on. Texting is a fast and convenient way to communicate with others. The practice has even made its way into the traditional classroom. Miss Elsa Turner, a reading language arts teacher, regularly uses a free educational internet texting site to communicate with her students. She says, I send reminders about homework, assignments, and notifications when I've updated online grades. The students love it because the information is short and relevant. The text help relieve stress over forgotten deadlines. <clears throat> a study by the Pew Research Center found that on average, older teenagers send about 60 texts per day and using texting as their dominant daily mode of communication. Their adult counterparts are not far behind in this rising trend. Perhaps the next time uh, it's, it's time to call the family to dinner, it might be more efficient to send a group text. All right. I just yelled through my daughter's door that dinner's ready. 
So using logic, you start by brainstorming many points of comparison, right? Thinking about that, I mentioned, you know, your, your prompt is just going to be basically you have two passages. Um, you're going to, you know, um, agree with one. Why do you agree with that one? And you're going to you know, discuss both in the passage. So as you read them, you know, start thinking about the points they're making. You're going to, you know, zero in on their on their argument then think about the claims and the points. So then, you know, choose the best three for your extended response. Three is going to do it. That's going to be enough time for you to write and not, uh, and not go over. About which points do you have the most to say? That's the other thing. Some are going to be a lot easier. You know, don't pull your hair out trying to find a comparison of a counterclaim. One may not have a counterclaim, the other may. So you're going to eliminate that one. Uh, so which points best support your thesis? Um, so here, let's, uh, let's say, Tracy, you want to answer our, mu our multiple choice here? Yes, which part of comparison best fits in the diagram about A, transition, transitional language, B, multitasking, C, uh, literacy, this sleep disruption, uh, What does both passages include? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Um, I think uh, I think a uh, transition language. Yeah, they both have transitional language. So a for number one, right? <clears throat> only the first one talks about multitasking, only the second one talks about literacy, and only the first one talks about sleep disruption. So the only thing that you could really compare there as far as those reasons uh, are transitional, or uh, you can't really compare those reasons, you could compare the evidence. So that leaves transitional language. So they have, like I said, this sort of clunky looking idea. Um, we're not gonna, I don't want you to focus on that too much, right? We're gonna just consider the points. I'm gonna kind of show you here, right? So for question uh, two, <clears throat> we're gonna start with a point, just like we did uh, in the quiz. And then for the next question, we're going to, you know, do a third point, then, uh, or sorry, second point, then a third point, and then we will look at evidence. So what evidence does Clement provide to support point one, point two, point three, right? And then we switch over to um, Liang, right? So wanting to use comparing points basically here, and then we'll look at their evidence. So, <clears throat> What could be the first point to make here? And it can go, you know, it can be anything. We could talk about tone. We could talk about um, rhetorical device. We could talk about, um, you know, evidence. What would be a point to make here? Is it the same as claim? What was that? Is it, is it the same as claim? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it, it, so, okay, let's look at that web again. We can use claims, right? Um, we can use any of those are, are basically fair game, right? So we can start with their, let's do that, actually. Let's start with their thesis, right? Their claims, their point of view. Um, 
that will probably, and maybe we'll kind of work our way, try to work our way around the wheel and see what we can find. I think that's a good idea. So the first point, um, Clements, So it's changing. Okay. Uh, but and what was her major claim there? That uh, it's changing yeah. the way people think, right? People think that social media uh, is. Although she actually used social media to use like digital, like technology or something. Uh, mobile devices socializing online. So we'll say mobile devices, just to kind of stick with her idea there. So I don't want to go too far. Wow, I really dropped. Okay. Uh, Clements claim that mobile uh, devices are changing the oh, struggle with this one today. Changing the way people think. And the young um, claims that social media is um, it? communication skills. Yes, improving communication skills. Improving communication skills. Okay, I'll copy that and paste it. So that's our first point, right? We're using their claim, we're using their thesis as our first point. That's a good place to start. Okay, so the next one, number three, we're gonna keep track of these. Okay, um, second point. So let's look at our web again. We wanna try reasons. That would be logical, right? Yeah. So, there we go. Um, we could start with their first reasons. Um, Clement, right? What was her first reason? They can't um, multitask. Multitask, right? So, yeah. uh, Clement, um, asserts, doesn't matter what you use there. Uh, let it review. I'm going to have to review a lot here. Um, uh, Clement asserts that uh, electronic devices do not help people learn to multitask. That's that's what we'll put. Electronic devices. Do not help learn to multitask. Okay. And the young play uh I would say assert um that I want to make sure I get the studies have shown that testing improves communication skills. Very good. All right. You're on top of it, Grace. Thank you so much today. All right, uh, so asserts, that should be asserts, not assets. Um, oh. That uh, social media improves it's, um, or literacy skills. Rather. Improves literacy skills, all right. Yeah. There we go, all right. So there's our second point. And we will be able to discuss that when we get into the body of the writing response. Okay, so paste. 
right. Reasons. Not reasons. Okay. Number four. Our third point here to be made. We're going to look at our will of compare and contrast. Okay. So we gave a reason. You want to look at evidence. We can go with that. Let's try evidence. And that will work well with our, our reasons here. So what evidence, they both, right? We, we actually have uh, a comparison here. So uh, they both use experts, right? They both cite experts. Okay. So that's all we need to put. Um, oh, can we say research? Oh. Say what? Re research. Yes, yes. They both cite um, research. Um, say research by experts. Okay. And okay, I'm out, I'm in the right spot, right? Yeah. Okay. So. We can compare from time to time. Okay. Put that in the chat. Okay, so now point one. What evidence does Clement provide to support point one? So what did we say for point one? Oh her claims, right? So that um, we can say, we don't have to get into, we can use the reasons, right? Um, since we're talking about the overall thesis here, uh, we can look at either, you know, the individual evidence or we can look at the reasons. So, um, what do we want to say about Clement? How about we just go with this? So we'll say uh, Clement uh, provides reasons like um, the uh, failure to learn multitasking. Yeah. Continuous partial attention, like obese, obese person now gives continuous partial attention. Yeah, and um, so, and uh, sleep disruption, right? That was yeah. the other big point. A reason, right? That was a reason. So we'll also say, um, and uh, show and discusses issues with sleep disruption. Disruption. There we go. Okay. And that supports, right? This is, you know, when it says evidence, I, I, I don't want that to confuse you. You know, I don't want you to think that we're looking necessarily at the evidence she uses. This is more about the evidence that we would use when we're talking about our points. So <clears throat> if I said, well, yeah, uh, Clement, um, you know, uh, talks about the um, change, you know, that it's changed the way people think. And if you're discussing it with somebody, uh, you know, somebody might ask you, it's like, oh, well, what does she say about that? Um, and you would be able to, you know, go further into detail as far as the, uh, the statements that she makes, and the reasons she gives. So that is in the chat now. Okay. And Moving along, so number six, now we need Clement's evidence for two. 
So now, right, we gave a reason. So we can look back again at the evidence. So we use the multitasking. Um, so we'll say uh, Clement. This might seem repetitive sometimes too. Clement cites um, research by Professor so and so of so and so university. What was that? Uh, Mary Rosen of uh, Cal State. I'm going to copy and paste that. <laughs> Lazy today. Okay. Um, so, by Professor Larry Rosen, a professor of psychology at California. And again, this is just sort for our own use and thinking about the evidence. So, we don't have to, you know, get into quoting every everything that he said we're just wanting to outline right we're outlining what um she had to say about that issue and the evidence she used so clement cites research by professor larry rosen professor of psychology at california state university dominguez hills okay then evidence from the third one. So going back, are right, starting to lose track? Our third point was both site research by experts. So we'll put in here what evidence does Clement provide to support point three. We'll put um, citing two experts. Professor Larry Boson and um, yeah, I'm gonna copy and paste that one too. Oh, I'm gonna grab copy and paste the whole thing. Cause we didn't talk about uh, her yet. Okay. Not too far down here. Okay, so point, and then we're gonna oh, where did I go? Okay. All right, here we go. Larry Rosen and okay. All right. So there's our first three points and our evidence for the first three points that we made, okay? Now we do the same for uh, Leon, right? So uh, number one was her um, claim about communication skills, right? Um, so she starts off with, uh, she gives, um, she discusses the improvement in language skills among social media users. So that's what we mentioned, you know, improvement of communication skills and improvement of language skills because of that. So that's going to work for evidence one. Okay. Evidence two, right? So we used point two was. Uh, uh, her assertion that social media improves literacy skills. So she cites, was it Beverly Plester? Yeah, 
Um, so she cites Beverly Plester in her claim. So she cites Beverly Plester. And then point three, point three, we used evidence, right? So we'll just say, oh, let me go look at that. Um, we're to say she cites experts in the fields of um, psychology. Oh, no, 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 wait, that was the first one. Uh, she, okay, no, she actually uses two different ones, right? So she uses, uh, Dr. Plester, um, you know what? Okay, so cites Dr. Beverly Plester and a language arts teacher. All right. So, and this is a lot of back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. So she cites Beverly Plester and uh, a, a language arts teacher, a reading and language arts teacher. So. Doctor. I want to make sure to get that doctor in there. And a language, language arts. Ah. Okay, now we're going to do it again. So this, uh, we're going to get uh, a fourth, fifth, and sixth point uh, doing the same thing. And then we'll follow up again. So we we'll, can continue around the wheel of comparison um, and maybe look at tone or rhetorical techniques or uh, counter claims. We want to look at let's let's look at the counter arguments. How about we do that? So for our fourth point, so we're basically starting over here. You could you know this is I want to think about a fourth, fifth, and sixth point more as a a an alternative one, two, and three. All right. So what counterclaims do both of these have? What does Clement mention? About the distraction? Um, well, about the, the multitasking, right? So she starts off with that. Um, so we're looking at, right? So we use it as a reason before, but now we're dealing with the counterclaim part of it, right? So she starts off that second sort of, you know, paragraph, I guess you could say, right? That second sentence says, you know, there's, you know, this thought that multitasking is, you know, uh, that every, you know, electronic devices help teach multitasking. So um, we'll just say broadly for our fourth point, um, addressing counterclaims because they both have counterclaims, right? And then when we get to the evidence, we'll look at those. So addressing counterclaims. Copy that. Okay. And then point 
five. Um, Let's say um, hmm. see tone doesn't Tone doesn't play a part as well as the first passage we looked at, right? Because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, Clement is discussing social media in a negative aspect, but she doesn't use that same type of tone. She doesn't, you know, really uh, uh, use a lot of language there to, you know, she's, she's pretty factual about it. And the same thing with Leung. It's not necessarily that there is some positive there. Um, but, um, rhetoric wise, we could look at that, right? So, um, let's, let's see here. We'll just put for now, and we're going to come back to it, rhetorical technique, because this did come up yesterday, rhetorical technique. Okay, so we will look at that further when we get to the evidence. Then last point, um, we could go back to, let's see, we could. Qualifying? Well, that, that's gonna be part of the rhetorical okay argument right so the, yeah we're, we're going to talk about that in the rhetorical techniques um yeah. uh let's let's uh, so in this book can we also use um the advantages and disadvantages it seems um yeah. uh, is it climate climate mm -hmm. is it's talking about the disadvantages and Leon is talking about advantages of using social media. Okay, yeah, so we'll just say um, advantages um, versus disadvantages. Okay, so that way we'll get them both in there. Um, and yeah, so we could outline, you know, that's, that's a good one, that's a good one. Advantages versus disadvantages or advantages and disadvantages really doesn't matter because we're just, you know, one's talking one way, one's talking the other. So copy paste here. Okay, and then 14, right now we're getting back to the evidence. So Clement, uh, we used, um, addressing counterclaims, right? So Clement, um, addresses uh, the claim of um, improved multitasking. By citing um, Larry, Professor Larry Rosen. That uh, oh go ahead and get a little detail here. Um, providing your attention um, um, Larry Rosen that dividing your attention. Prevents an individual from 
performing tasks. Uh, performing tasks with quality. All right, I think that kind of gets the point of it. All right, so she addressed the counterclaim. There's her evidence to go along with it. Okay, and then let's see, the next one, what do we use? Rhetorical technique. So there we go. This is where we get into that qualifying idea. Uh, Clement qualifies her statements on the potential downside of uh, electronic devices. Because um, because of the, the lack of um, say this, the Clint qualifies her statement on the potential downside of electronic devices. Um, Uh, because of a lack of unknown long-term effects. Okay, how does that sound? Good. Right, so, and that, you mentioned that, right? So rhetorical, uh, or uh, sorry, qualifying statements a lot of times can emphasize a point. You can add to it, um, but it can also weaken statements. And I, I've mentioned this, you know, look when you're, you know, doing your writing response, do they use qualifying statements? Do they use this kind of, um, you know, may, should, could, you know, it, 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 it weakens your statement. If, if, you know, I'm saying, you know, this may uh, cause that, then there's, you know, a, a qualification. Uh, there's lack of certainty. Right. So you want to be careful there and look for those types of things, as I mentioned. And when you're writing, you know, avoid that language. Write in active uh, voice and and speak with certainty. Um, you know, don't don't play the middle road. You know, stick with one passage, agree with one passage and be very assertive in your writing. OK, so. The last one, then, we used um, advantages and disadvantages, right? So, Clement, uh, evidence for disadvantages. So, we can talk sort of generally about the things that she pointed out there, right? So, yeah. what do you think, Grace? This one was yours. <laughs> um, so, uh, climate. In the first, he, she says, it it can cause a um, mental, like a long term effect. How should I even put it? Uh, for the, uh, uh, a minute. Um, Um, well, so said, um, the frequent sleep interruption make it harder for the brain to consolidate the day's learning and memories. So it has effect on on the brain. Mm -hmm. So we, we can just say, um, uh, Clement um, points out um, the uh, potential effects on the brain. Yeah. 
negative effects. Let, let's let's make sure we put that in there because, right? Neg yeah. Okay. It's because she is she's you know not supporting the idea of, of social media and electronic devices. Okay, and I'll copy and paste that one. All right, and um, so back to Young now <clears throat> with our points there. So we started with um, what did we start with? This this is this is where it gets tricky because constantly going back to look, review things. Uh, so, okay, so um, point four. So Clinton addresses. Oh, that was the evidence. Um, all the way back up here. Okay, point four. I want to write these down so we don't have to keep coming back to them. So addressing counterclaims, right? Yeah. So what was the counterclaim that she addresses? Climate or Jones? Oh, um, um, Leon. Leon, yeah. The okay. uh, the the grammar thing, right? About how uh, bad grammar is going to sneak into. Um, so uh, her uh, uh, Leon refutes the claim uh, that um, poor grammar uh, is appearing in um, traditional communication, right? I think that, you know, she's talking about paper and stuff like that. Um, uh, by citing Dr. Pepper Lester, okay? And you know, this is kind of a shorthand for us. If you were to write about that in, in your passage, you would actually want to give a little explanation of what you know Dr. Beverly Plester says. Um, but here for our purposes, since we've already read it and everything, and this is for our own notes basically, <clears throat> we'll just move on. So, um, right, Leung refutes the claim that poor grammar is appearing in traditional communication by citing Dr. Beverly Plester. So right, that was the claim and then she shows us that, nope, that's not happening yet. So both, right, we have that in both. So, um, and then the fifth one, we were talking about rhetoric, right? So rhetorical devices. And what does Leon use? You guys remember? Yeah, bad one, bad one, bad one, bad one, rhetoric. <laughs> Bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, bandwagon. So, uh, so uh, Leung uses uh, bandwagon rhetoric. Uh, by stating that uh, more and more uh teenagers and adults are using uh are texting yeah i'll say texting testing texting and using social media right just because your friends are doing it doesn't mean you should everybody jumps off a bridge are you gonna do it too Oh, and I forgot to hit enter again for our last one. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's right. No, you're not. And I, you know, <clears throat> you're going to get to a point with your kids where you're going to start sounding like your mother and start, you know, I've, I've already realized that it all comes around. Um, just trying to get my kid to eat a vegetable every once in a while is my struggle right now. So, yeah, so Leung uses bandwagon band now i'm going to do it. bandwagon rhetoric bandwagon rhetoric uh by stating that more and more teenagers and adults are texting and using social media so you know we have uh rhetoric techniques being used by both 
Um, and that's something you could definitely, definitely, definitely want to point out uh, in a writing response. And then our last one, right? So advantages, right? The young went with advantages. So um, what do you want to say, Grace? Um, okay. He says, um, 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 he says it's a fast and convenient way of communicating with others. Testing. Testing is a fast and convenient way to communicate with others. And uh, we'll go ahead and say may improve communication skills, right? Because that was their kind of overall point as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have really dissected these two uh, passages, and well, the, those four, right? Because the 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 Jones and the Clift one as well. We've really dug into them, and and analyzed them to death these last few days. But this is exactly, you know, and it, it's it's stuff that we're really slowing down the process, right? And taking this, you know, step by painstaking step. Uh, you're going to do this in a much more organic and intuitive way when you're actually reading and you'll, you know, make your own little mental notes. Maybe you'll, you know, just certainly just jot down things. Now, you know, we're, we're really teasing out everything at the moment. So, you know, don't worry about time and things like that. Don't let this trip you up. This is just another exercise to help you get through those ideas. So yeah, Leon uh, states texting uh, is a fast and convenient way. So we had advantages compared to disadvantages. Now, what we got to do here? So review the six points for which you have recorded text evidence. Think about the three points you will use for your extended response. Read the question and write your answer in the space provided. So sort of building out what we've looked at, thinking about three points here. Um, I think, is this the last one? Okay, whoa, 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 we got a couple more to do. Um, so which three points did you select for your extended response? And then we'll write in my extended response, I will focus on these three points of comparison. Let me look ahead, do we do? Okay, so the next one, it's wanting three points best support my thesis statement. And then these three points do not support my thesis statement as well because. So out of the six that we did, what do you think would be the strongest points to discuss in a written response? I would say rhetoric because that on either side, you can make a very good case for or against, right? Both of those use a, a, a type of rhetoric that you could actually see as a problem. The bandwagon is a problem and the qualifying statements are a problem. So um, that could definitely be one I would, I would go with. And again, you know, as we go along and in, in, in your writing response, you may not see that. But for here, let's say, excuse me, um, as far as our one of our three points, um, the. Um, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Rhetoric. Um, uh, the rhetorical devices. used by the authors. Okay, so that's gonna be point one. What else do you think we could use here? Out of those six that we came up with, what do you think is the best? I didn't quite get the question. So we're looking now at, um, so, you know, we did six different points, right? Mm -hmm. Out yeah. six that we did, if we were to build a writing response around three of them, okay. what three are the strongest? And I went ahead and chose the rhetorical devices used by the authors, because I think that's one that you could discuss uh, 
with either being sort of an issue, what would be a second really good point that you could discuss in your written response out of the six that we did? Oh, oh. Mm. Evidence? The claim. As, what was that? The claim. Claims. Okay. Yeah. So uh, their overall claims. Mm. Three. I, I'm going to go ahead and go with evidence. Okay. Um, there's a problem with one of them that we didn't really point out yet. Uh, and I, I think it would, might be you know, it, it's definitely worth pointing out. So now it's asking us to say, why did you choose these three points for your extended response? These three points best support my thesis statement because, um, you know, th th this is just, you know, both, um, both, passages use uh, rhetorical devices that weaken their um, arguments. Yeah. Um, and then second, so their overall claims, um, both make strong claims that are um, easy to discuss and um, finally the evidence um, both have strong uh, supporting evidence, but if I add this, um, may show some uh, um, problems. Okay, so And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. So that's in the chat now. And why did you eliminate the other three points? Um, just we'll just say generally um, the other points did not have a strong enough. Evidence. Evidence. And I was also thinking um, maybe a strong, uh, have, let's see this, um, strong support. Enough evidence or enough contrast, right? Because both the way they, the way they both go about their counterclaims. Right, they they both sign a counterclaim and they both use, uh, you know, a, a, a good evidence. So it would be difficult to, you know, if one of them point out a counterclaim and then use like an Ill, some illogical evidence or something or bad reasoning, you you know, that would be something you might want to jump on. But in this case, that one's not great because they both use, you know, a very clear, uh, very strong evidence. Um, so you know you're wanting to look for very strong comparisons or very strong contrast when you're, when you're writing about it, right? If there's weak or maybe there's no real, you know, good uh, contrast, they both don't use the same type of devices or something like that. That's a problem. What I was talking about here. Um, so that that's it. Okay. For uh, the exercise. One thing I want to point out with Leon that we didn't discuss yet. Okay, now we mentioned the bandwagon, right? And we mentioned the qualifying for uh, Cliff. I want to go back up here and we're going to take a look before we submit this 
and then this, uh, you know, we're, we're towards the end here. So uh, Clement, right, she uses two experts. She uses Larry Rosen, right, professor who's discussing multitasking. And then below, she uses uh, Kaveri, uh, uh for the sleep interruption. It could be seen as a weakness here with Leung's passage because she does with her refuting the claim about language and grammar skills, she uses Dr. Beverly Plester, okay? And she quotes there. Her second evidence though, she uses an anecdote, right? So she just uses the one um, person's experience. So, you know, she says, furthermore, texting is a fast and convenient way. That's something else like transitional language. You know, somebody might use those. That's really a hard one to kind of compare and contrast. But furthermore, texting is a fast and convenient way to communicate with others. The practice has even made its way into the traditional classroom. Um, Miss Elsa Turner, a reading and language arts teacher, now she, her on her own, you know, she's an expert in the classroom and she's an expert with maybe using this particular material, uh, but regularly uses a free educational internet texting site to communicate with their students, right? That's a specific experience. So if you were to want, if you're saying, if you wanted to go with Clement, right? If you're saying she has the stronger argument, she's making the better case. And then you would go through, you know, point one, her evidence here, her evidence there. Um, Leung, however, uh, while uses one expert, also uses an antidote from Miss Elsa Turner about using a text app in her class, right? That's the one thing that really got me between the first one and the second one. The first one uses two experts um, and citing research the second one uses one expert with research and one anecdote. It's very, you know, nuanced, um, but that's something that you could definitely get into and point out. Okay. Um, so any questions? I know it's a lot. That's a lot to go through. And again, don't, you know, we really slowed it down and we're taking that piece by piece. Your brain doesn't necessarily work, you know, in, in, in that pulling out like every little brick of Lego uh, to build something. So what do you guys think about that? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the, 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 the bigger picture here, right? Three points. That's what you want to look for, right? So we're going to deal with um, also uh, constructing an a introduction and conclusion down the road. So, you know, when we get to the body, you're thinking about, okay, I need to find three points here and I need to show where one is basically going to be stronger and one is weaker as I go along. So with Clement, she uses this. This is great. Leung, not so much. However, you know, whatever the passages are going to be. The ones they're giving us are pretty close. Um, the ones in the actual test tend to have one that is more of an appeal to emotion and one that is more fact-based. Um, so it's something else to look for. We haven't dealt with that yet. We might get some more passages here in the future um, that will be a little more varied. Um, because so far, you know, both of these have had, you know, some pretty good evidence and stuff. So it's making us kind of work a little hard. Um, any other questions? So, of course, this is going to be up on Google Classroom. And um, I'll have, I'll put up the, the, the comparison wheel. So those are the points that you should think about always using, you know, to, to compare and contrast. Rhetoric, evidence, claims that whole field, okay? Um, and then of course, we're gonna get more practice and I'm gonna have you guys, I wanna set you guys free and, and do an entire passage for me, uh, a response here when we finish up this unit, all right? So I think Monday, I don't know if Rachel mentioned this, it's a holiday, right? Did Rachel say anything? 
Yes, it did. Okay, so we've got a long weekend. <laughs> so we won't be back until Tuesday, right? Yeah. I'm always scared about that. I mean, I know we have holidays and <laughs> Rachel and I are really bad at keeping up with them. If you haven't noticed, that's why you get a text on Friday after we talk to Tracy, uh, you know, cause we always meet with her on Friday. We're like, it's Monday a holiday. And she's like, yes. And we're like, oh, okay, sorry. We've got to text everybody. Um, yeah. So in that case, um, that's going to be a good opportunity. You got your guys social studies uh, practice test. Um, so you can review that and I'll start reaching out to you guys um, as far as anything else we can do. All right. Okay. You guys have a good weekend. Stay warm, stay dry, and I'll see you Tuesday. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.